Today we're going to be talking about elastic strain, stress and strain in materials. So oh, generally we've been talking about numerical methods. How do we use computers and math to solve problems? We're talking about linear algebra, Newton's method, integration, statistical, standard deviation, linear interpolation, extrapolation. We've been doing modeling, mass balances, looking at modeling cells or processes, forces for static equilibrium and something that's more mechanical. Today we're going to talk about materials, start into elastic and viscoelastic materials. We've been doing software with MATLAB and Excel. We're eventually going to start moving into COMSOL, which is for simulating complex systems. So today's stress and strain, Young's modulus, elastic and plastic deformation. Stress and strain. Stress is a quantity that reflects internal forces within the body. So basically, when you put a force on something, how much basically stress is it under? Strain is a quantity that reflects deformation or elongation of the body. So how much does that material stretch or contract when you put some force on it. Why do we normalize things? We have to normalize these so that our experimental results will be valid across experiments. So we can move from just a descriptive, like an experimental results to an actually an equation-based kind of framework, constitutive framework, so that we can compare different experiments. And how do we actually normalize? Well, for stress, if we look at the force that we apply to a material and divide it by a cross-sectional area, that's our stress sigma, which is not the same as standard deviation. Force per area is our stress, and that is the value that basically lets us compare small samples to large samples or different machines. Strain is the length of the value from minus the initial length over the initial length. So that strain is how much it deforms. And again, it could be a small material, medium-sized material, piece of material, or a large piece of material. The civil engineers have and stress and strain gauges that go up to you know beams that are size for bridges. Biomedical systems are typically much smaller sample sizes. So what do we actually do? We're typically doing uniaxial studies. So you put a load or displacement, you just take a piece of the sample, you pull it apart, and you look at the force. Um, you measure the force and the displacement as you move along the experiment, and you calculate the stress and strain if you know the cross-sectional area and the initial, uh, initial length of the material. So what units do we have? For stress, you have force per unit area, so that's newtons per meter squared, which ends up being a pascal. So stress is measured in units of pressure. Strain, on the other hand, is elongation, or basically length over length, so it's going to be a percent elongation. So it's a, a unitless value, because we don't treat percentages as unitless. For our biological systems, you typically have uh, some sort of piece of material, or a, a, a testing equipment usually a motor, maybe a pump and some chamber to control the environment, grips to hold the sample, and you load it into a cell and you have some software to calculate and, calculate and collect data. A lot of different ma machines will use a dog bone where you can attach the shaped material, so a, a 2D piece of material, but you stamp out or cut a dog bone shape. You can attach the material to these ends and then put it under tension to pull it apart and measure the displacement as you, and the forces as you pull that material apart. Sometimes you have a sample and you put it under compression and you maybe a cylinder and you can have a hydraulic system that crushes it and you measure the displacement. It just depends on the, the type of system you're looking at. So for our elastic deformation, we're going to calculate the Young's modulus. It's a symbol of large capital E, and it basically represents this linear response for stress as a function of strain. That as you have increasing stress, you have increasing strain, and our units of stress are going since they're force per area. That means the units of the Young's modulus are going to also be in pressure. So we have this linear regime for most materials where we can have a Young's modulus that describes the stiffness of the material. Stiffer materials have a bigger slope. That means for the same stress, you have a small amount of strain. So if you have the same amount of stress here, you might have a larger amount of strain for a, 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 a normal material. And for the same amount of stress, you may have a whole lot of deformation for a very soft material that's not very stiff. There are lots of different materials with lots of different Young's modulus values, stiffness. So you should know the order of magnitude. There are some polymers that are under 10, they're fairly soft, not very stiff. Bone is on the order of 15 to 30, and metals and ceramics can get up into hundreds of gigapascals. Note the units here, not megapascals, gigapascals. Different materials also may elongate the strain before they fail, some things are malleable, but think some things are more ceramic and barely um, elongate at all, so you may not have any strain. It just basically goes into a failure mode. Um, 
bone, depending on the bone and the structure, may elongate 5%. You can have a significant deformation. Some polymers don't elongate very much or don't deform very well, but some are very soft and, and, and malleable. Well, we have elastic deformation and plastic deformation. Elastic deformation is reversible. It comes back in plastic is irreversible deformation. An example I use is the, the metal wire, like a coat hanger. You bend it a little bit, it's like a spring. It'll go back into, into um, the same location, the same length. If you bend it beyond or too much, it will put a permanent bend that's irreversible, a kink in the coat hanger. So you have a, a plastic deformation of that material. So most materials have an elastic regime. So there's, if you just have a small amount of deformation or small amount of stress, there's got to be some sort of measurable area where you can find an elastic regime for Young's modules. At low strains, you're stretching bonds, but in higher strains, you're starting to rearrange bonds. So we are um, deforming that material basically instantaneously at the same time the load is applied. A full stress strain curve may look like this, where you have a sample and you basically have a motor that pulls it apart, you measure the deformation, and continuously measure the pressure or the force as you pull it apart. The slope is the Young's modulus for this, this regime. Beyond a certain point, it's no longer proportional, and that Young's modulus relationship for stress and strain doesn't hold. You get into this plastic regime after the yield point. Beyond the yield point, this is what we call the plastic regime, and there's an ultimate tensile strength, the largest strength, and then the ultimate breaking strength is here, so that's stress there. So these basically take a material to that point, and it won't change up and down the curve for these elastic types of materials. If you pull it apart up to this point, it'll stay there forever at that stress and strain structurally. Young's modulus is irreversible. It's reversible. It can go up and down this in this proportional regime. But once you get into the plastic regime, if you release the stress, the material will relax, not back to the origin. Young's modulus relationship assumes that your stress strain is zero at the origin. When you relax something that's in the plastic regime, it will relax, but it doesn't deform back to its normal shape, so you have a plastic irreversible strain here. And the slope of that relaxation line looks like the Young's modulus line. You have extrinsic and intrinsic properties. So your extrinsic properties depend on the amount of material. And it's like volume, your mass, extensive properties, basically how much of the stuff you have there. Intrinsic is independent of the amount. So you can density, you can measure the same density if you have a milliliter, a liter, a million gallons of something. Same thing for viscosity. It's intrinsic to the material. You don't have to have a lot of, you may have to have a, at least a big enough sample to measure but it doesn't matter how much you have. The intrinsic properties are always there, or intensive properties. Intrinsic and intensive, extrinsic and extensive. Some of our intrinsic properties, it doesn't matter how much you have. The elastic modulus, this is what we're talking about, the Young's modulus. The bulk modulus relates changing the pressure to changing the volume of the material. Like if you've ever seen the YouTube video of a marshmallow that's put under vacuum, it can expand significantly. Have a, bulk modulus to figure out how much it expands under changes in pressure. And the Poisson ratio is how much, if you pull apart, say, a normal rectangular sample, how much this lateral width changes as opposed to the actual width. So if you have this, this necking of the material, the normalized width over the normalized length, this lateral strain over this uh, axial strain. So most of our Young's modulus, we're just talking about axial strain. And we have this relationship between isotropic elastic materials that has been derived so that you can convert between the three different properties. So if you have the bulk modulus and the Poisson ratio, you can back out the Young's modulus. So these are the relationships that hold between these three properties. Which one is probably hardest to measure out of these three? Going back. We know stress and strain are fairly easy to do for elastic modulus. Bulk modulus you change the pressure and measure volume with displacement methods fairly easily. Looking at a sample and determining accurately what this necking value for the width of a sample is can be very difficult. So I think Poisson ratio is typically one of the more difficult things to determine. We also have homogeneous and heterogeneous properties. Homogeneous properties are the same throughout the material. So you can take a sample from one portion or another portion, like a piece of metal 
a metal alloy. It's all the same, no matter where you sample it. It's the polymers, there's lots of things that are homogeneous. Heterogeneous, though, vary throughout the computer. So a mechanically heterogeneous material may be like a composite. Fiberglass is an example, carbon fiber, where you have something embedded in a polymer. Um, that's pretty common for a lot of different composites. You want to have strengths, you want two different types of properties. Uh, for the fiberglass, you have pieces of glass fiber embedded in epoxy, and that gives you a composite stronger than just the fiberglass or the epoxy on its own, and you have lighter weight too. So it really depends on, for heterogeneous, the scale that you're looking at. If you look at a very small sample of fiberglass, it might look homogeneous because you've only got epoxy samples or glass samples. So you have to be sort of careful when you're looking at heterogeneous properties. There's also isotropic and anisotropic. Isotropic properties are the same no matter what direction you measure. So polymers and metals are typically going to be isotropic. Anisotropic materials have directional dependence. So maybe they have layers on the material that make, it, make it, depending on if you want to measure vertically or left or right, some different types of bone and biomedical tissues may be anisotropic. If you stretch versus bend, you're going to get different results from your sample. We also have to talk about types of models. Constitutive models reflect the composition of the material. So like most of the models we're talking about, we have an equation that relates one thing to another, as opposed to a descriptive model where we can have just basically like a, a force displacement curve. It's without normalizing, without coming up with a, a constitutive relationship between stress and strain, that descriptive model may be good for sampling or producing a product, but it wouldn't be useful if you change the testing conditions or change the type of product. You don't know anything other than one specific set of conditions. And that is all for today.